Uh, the 21st, we're going to 8 and 10 o'clock, two services Sunday morning. Second service at 10 will be in the outdoor amphitheater. And then May 28th, which is the last Sunday of next month, uh, starting tomorrow, so May 28th, uh, we're going from 6.30 to 6. So Bible study will start at 6, and then at 5 o'clock, we're going to serve food and fellowship. So if you guys want to come and eat and hang out with us, we'd love to do that with you. Uh, we have a guest speaker tonight. I know most of you probably know that. Uh, his name is Jason Lyle. And he's been here before, so I, I know most of you guys are familiar with him, but he's the founder of the uh, Biblical Science Institute. Uh, he's an astrophysicist, and uh, as you can tell, he's a lot, got a lot of resources back there. But what I like to, when I think of Jason, he takes complicated subject matter and simplifies it in a way that you can understand it. So he's smooth to listen to and uh, has a lot of topics. He, he taught on uh, logic at our ministry conference. He did uh, uh, this morning what, what I would refer to as textual criticism, but it's basically where we got the Bible and how do you know that it's a word and all that stuff. So I don't know what he's going to be talking about tonight, but please welcome Jason Lyle. The uh, topic tonight, I think, is uh, just especially interesting. It's something that when I discovered this uh, years ago, and uh, I, I just couldn't help but tell others about it because it's just so fascinating. What if there was a secret code built into numbers, numbers like one, two, three, four? What if there was a code built into that, a code of incredible complexity and beauty? What would that, what would that mean? I'm sure this is picking me up. I mean, there was, this, there was that movie... Um, uh, National Treasure, remember that movie where they found a code on the back of the, what was the Declaration of Independence? And that showed that there were some really clever people who had, who had written that. But what if, what if there's a code built into math itself? Because it's, I mean, who made math? That's interesting. And what, what, would it, what would it mean if there's a code built into numbers? That would suggest that there is a very powerful mind behind the existence of numbers. And that's going to that's going to stretch us a little bit because we, we like to think about God creating physical things, which he did, of course, making the stars and the animals and the, the earth and the continents and so on. The Lord created all those. We, we tend not to think about God being responsible for numbers, but he is. God's sovereign over all truth, including abstract truth like numbers that exist in the mind. Interesting. So, we have a little bit of work to do, though, before we get into the really neat stuff. It's kind of like when I was a little kid and my mother would prepare these wonderful meals. She's a very good cook, but every now and then she would make something I didn't like, like broccoli. Ugh. And the rule was you had to eat everything on your plate before you could get up and, and do something fun. So um, in, in rare moments of maturity, I would eat the broccoli first to get it out of the way so that I could then enjoy the rest of the meal. So in that same spirit, we got a little broccoli to do first, but stay with me because it's going to get really cool. It's going to get really neat. So we're going to start with some definitions. A set in, in mathematics, a set is a collection of elements with a common defined property. In this case, numbers. Uh, so a set of numbers are a group of numbers that have something in common with each other. And in most sets, some numbers are included and others are excluded. Although you can't have the set of all numbers, and you can, or you could have the set of no numbers. You can have an empty set. But in most sets, some numbers are part of the set and other numbers are not. So, for example, if I said consider the set of even numbers, then you would know that those numbers belong and, and the rest that are on there do not belong in that set. So we, we understand that. And that one's pretty easy to recognize because we know that numbers are even if they end in 0, 2, 4, 6, or 8. So that's, that's easy. A different set would have different numbers in it, though. So consider the set of negative numbers. And that would include those numbers, but it would not include the others. And so we get that. That makes sense. And again, you can tell just by looking at the number whether or not it belongs. If it's got a little minus sign in front of it, it's part of the set. And, there's some, and, and you know, some numbers belong to both sets, like negative 2 is both even and also negative. So it's a member of both of those sets. Now we're going to deal with a set that is a little bit more complicated in that you can't tell whether a number belongs just by looking at it, although I'd be impressed if you could. We're going to deal with what's called the Mandelbrot set. And this is something that uh, mathematicians were exploring, especially in the 80s. That's when this became really fascinating because the Mandelbrot set is defined to be all numbers C, we're going to represent a lowercase c as a potential Mandelbrot number. It's a candidate, Mandelbrot candidate for which this sequence, z sub n, remains small according to that little formula. And that may look very complicated, but it's actually 
but very straightforward. That little formula is a recursive algorithm. That means it's, you're repeating a process over and over again. Computers are very good at that. And so Z, sub Z is a number, another number, and the little, the little lowercase uh, n that's a subscript indicates that there are many Zs. There is, there is a zero, there's a Z zero, there's a Z one, Z two, Z three, Z four. Each one of those is like a little mailbox that contains a number and you don't know what it is right off the bat. But basically, the previous number, you add it to C and that will determine the next number in the sequence. That's the n plus one. That means the next mailbox is determined by the content of the previous mailbox plus C. You get that? And we'll, we'll see how it works by doing a couple of examples. But the Mandelbrot set is defined to be all those numbers C for which that sequence of Zs remains small. What's small? Let's say smaller than two, okay? So if it, ever, if it gets, because there's only two possibilities. When we generate that sequence of numbers, it'll either get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, or it won't. Those are the only two possibilities, right? And if it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, then it's not, then C is not a part of the Mandelbrot set. But if the sequence stays small, then C is a part of the Mandelbrot set. So let, let's do an example and it'll, that'll make it a lot clearer. So we're gonna ask, is the number one part of the Mandelbrot set? So C equals one, that's our candidate, the number one. So we're gonna put that into the formula for C. So now we have Z squared plus one equals the next value of Z, Z in plus one. Now, the first Z is zero by definition. So the first, so Z sub N, the first one is zero. So we're gonna put that in we have zero squared. So zero times zero is zero, plus one is one. Yeah, so that's our next value of Z. So we're gonna put that in the line up there. And since that's the next value of Z, we're gonna put it back into the formula, like that. Okay, so now we have one squared, which is one, plus one is two, right? So that's our next value of z. See what we're doing there? Put that back in. Two squared is four plus one is five, right? So put that back in. Five squared, 25 plus one, 26. Put that back in. 26 squared, a big number, plus one. You see what's happening there? Is the sequence of z staying small? No, it's not. You can see it's gonna get bigger and bigger. We don't have to do any more. We can see the pattern it's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. So is the number one part of the Mandelbrot set? No, because the sequence of Z did not stay small. So there you go. So we just proved that the number one is not part of the Mandelbrot set. Pretty neat. Let's try another one just for clarity. How about negative one? So let's put negative one in. So now it's Z squared minus one is the new value of Z. Z always starts as zero. So put that in, zero squared, zero, minus one is Negative one, put that back in. Negative one squared is positive one. Positive one minus one is zero. Well, that looks familiar. Put that back in. Zero squared minus one, negative one. Put that back in, negative one. See what's happening there? Zero, negative one, zero, negative one, zero, negative one. Is the sequence staying small? It sure is. You can see it'll never grow outside those two values. So is the number negative one part of the Mandelbrot set? Yes. It is, there you go. And uh, we won't do any more because that's tedious, but you, you get the idea, right? Any one of you, you now can, you, you can discover if any number belongs to the Mandelbrot set. You just run it through that formula and you see what happens. If the sequence gets big, it's not a part of the number. If the sequence stays small, it is. If we did zero, you'd find it just stays zero, zero, zero. So zero is part of the Mandelbrot set as well. Now there's one more complication and then we get to the really good stuff. The complication is that the Mandelbrot set also includes what we call complex numbers and what we call imaginary numbers. And I hate that terminology, because imaginary, what's an imaginary number? Is that something you're just pretending exists? No, it's, they do exist. It's just an imaginary number is, that's the name we give to numbers that when you square them, you get a negative number. And so the sort of, uh, the, the prototype imaginary number, we abbreviate with a lowercase letter i, and by definition, i squared is equal to negative one. So i is the square root of negative one, if you will. And that's a little hard for us to comprehend, right? Because how, I mean, you know about squaring numbers, you multiply it by itself, right? And most numbers, when you multiply them by themselves, you get a positive number, right? If you take a positive number and square it, you get a positive number. If you take a negative number and square it, you get a positive number. And if you take zero squared, you get zero. 
So how, where do we put imaginary numbers? They're not positive, because the positive squared is positive. They're not negative, because the negative squared is positive. And they're not zero, because zero squared is zero. How do you have a number that when you square it, you get a negative? And that's a little challenging for us, but mainly it's because we, most of us never gain experience with these so-called imaginary numbers, and so they seem a little strange at first. But it's kind of like when you're a little kid and you're first exposed to negative numbers. Originally, they didn't make a lot of sense, right? You can say, I can understand that you can have two apples and three apples, but how do you have negative six apples? How does that work, right? But then you get a little bit older, you get a bank account, suddenly negative numbers start making a lot of sense, don't they? Yeah, yes I can have less than nothing, so yeah. So it's the same way with the so-called imaginary numbers, it's just that most adults never gain experience with those because they, they um, well, it's just, we don't need them for, for most of our activities in life. But they do exist, and one way you can think about them is to consider a number line. So there's all the num well, we've, we can't show the entire number line because it's infinite, but we're, we're showing a section of it there and it continues infinitely to the left and the right. Now the numbers to the right of zero, we call those positive numbers. The numbers to the left of zero, we call those negative numbers. Where would you put imaginary numbers on there? Well, you'd put it, how about up there? That works. It's not positive. It's not to the right of zero. It's not negative. It's not to the left of zero. And clearly it's not zero either because it's not there. You can think of the imaginary numbers as being along a different axis. That's a good way to think about it. And by multiplying i, the imaginary number that's the square root of negative one, by multiplying it by any of the other numbers that are along the, what we call the real number line, you can get half i and negative i and so on. You can get all the other imaginary numbers, you see, on that vertical axis. So we call them imaginary, they do exist, that's just that's just a name, and to add insult to injury, the other numbers that are along the x-axis, we call those real, so real and imaginary, but they both exist. They are equally true to the mind of God, let's put it that way. You can also have numbers that are off-axis, like you have one, a number there, one plus uh, one-half i, and that has a, that's, we call that a complex number, because it has a real part and it has an imaginary part, and the real part tells you how long across the x-axis to plot it, and the imaginary part tells you how high up on the y-axis to plot it, okay? So that's a complex number. Now the neat thing about using complex numbers is you can use one number to represent any point on a plane. That's kind of neat because a plane's two-dimensional, right? And you just use the real component to give the x position and you have use the uh, imaginary component to give the y position. So what we want to do and what mathematicians were trying to do in the 80s is figure out is there a pattern to the Mandelbrot set? Because remember, you can't tell just by looking at a number is the number one-fourth part of the Mandelbrot set. You can't tell just by looking at it. You've got to run it through that formula uh, to see if it blows up or stays the same, right? And so mathematicians were trying to find a pattern. And so they thought, well, let's make a map of which points belong to the Mandelbrot set. And what we'll do is we'll run the numbers through the computer. A computer can do that calculation very quickly, and it can, it can discover if it, if it goes off to infinity or if it stays if, if the sequence of z stays small. And what we'll do is we will make a map there for it. Now the points that do belong to the Mandelbrot set, we'll color those black, just by convention. Remember we, we did negative one, and we found it does belong because it goes negative one, zero, negative one, zero. It just kind of loops back on itself. Uh, zero, if we had tried that, it stays zero, so that it, it's part of the Mandelbrot set. And if we had checked other numbers, including the complex numbers and imaginary numbers, we would find that, indeed, all these points belong to the Mandelbrot set. There is a pattern, and you can see a shape starting to emerge. The points that do not belong, we'll give them another color, like red. Remember, we checked one, and we found that one blows up, right? It, Z gets really big really fast. So it does not belong. And if we checked all these other points, we would find that they also do not belong to the Mandelbrot set. The sequence of Z gets very big, very fast. Pretty neat. And you can see there's a pattern emerging. There, there, it's not just madness, there is a pattern to the Mandelbrot set. And it's a far more interesting and intricate pattern than anyone ever would have guessed. Because as we fill in more and more points and we have the computer check more and more values, we find that the map of the points that belong to the Mandelbrot set looks like this. Pretty weird and unexpected. I mean, you think maybe a circle or something. It turns out to be an incredibly sophisticated shape. So what you're seeing there is a map 
of all the points that belong to the Mandelbrot set in black. And if they don't belong, I gave them a color. And I shaded the colors so if the sequence of Z gets really big really fast, I made it kind of a, like a dark red. Now if the sequence of Z gets big, but it does so slowly, so it's just outside the Mandelbrot set, I made it a brighter color like yellow in that case. So it's, it's shaded according to how far away it is from the Mandelbrot set in terms of how quickly the sequence of Z escapes. So, and that gives it, that makes it easier to see the shape actually. So pretty neat. So now we don't have to uh, go through and go through that little formula. The computer's already done that. It's checked all those points and it's made a map of the result. So is the number negative one part of the Mandelbrot set? You can see it is because it's in black. And it's interesting too because this, this sh shape has certain mathematical properties to it. Uh, you can see that around the point negative one, there is a perfect circle there. Now it's got stuff growing off of it, but it's a, it's a circle with a radius of exactly one fourth. That's kind of interesting. And you can see that zero belong, you can see that one half I, one half I does belong to the Mandelbrot set. You can see it's black on the plot. I'm gonna remove the uh, axes so we can study the shape because no one was expecting that when you make a map of the Mandelbrot set, it would have that weird shape. Now I noticed three features on this shape when we, when we take a look at it. They're, the biggest feature, it's called a cardioid. And that's that heart-shaped structure. A cardioid is what you get when you take one circle and roll around another, keeping your pencil affixed to the same point on the one circle. See? That's a cardioid. And that is exactly the shape that you get for the main portion of the Mandelbrot set. Why? I have no idea. There, I'm sure there's a reason. I just don't know what it is. But it's kind of amazing, isn't it? Because that little formula, z squared plus c, that has nothing to do with circles, right? And yet somehow we got a circle on a circle. Weird. The other shapes that you see are perfect circles, and they're sort of growing off the cardioid, including the large ones centered at negative one. So we have those little circles growing everywhere. And then the other things that you probably see are these little antennae that, that, um, that stem off and kind of jiggle around. And there's one that's perfectly straight, and that's the, uh, the spike that you see over on the left, right? That spike, that's the only one that's perfectly straight. All the other ones wiggle. Now we can zoom in on this by plotting these points at, at finer and finer resolutions. So that's kind of a neat thing to do. And we find that uh, the, the Mandelbrot set has certain really interesting properties that no one was expecting. So take a look at that largest circle on the top. And you'll find that it branches, you see a stem coming off of it, and then it branches into two others for a total of three stems, including the trunk, right? You see that? Now, if you go to the next one down on the, uh, on the left, the next largest circle on the left, it branches into five. Can you see that? And if we continue down to the next one, now they're getting smaller and harder to see, but the next one's seven, the next one's nine, 11, 13, all the odd numbers. It's as if the Mandelbrot know, knows about all the odd numbers and has listed them all the way down and there's an infinite number of them. The circles get smaller and smaller and smaller. You think, well, there can't be an infinite number of them because they all got to fit in there, but they become infinitely small, you see. So you can actually pack in an infinite number of circles. So there's actually an infinite number of all the odd numbers all the way down to infinity, odd infinity, whatever that means. That's kind of mind blowing. And then on the other side, if you go over to the right, the next largest circle on the right, you can see it branches into four. And the next one, five, six, seven. So you have all the numbers on the right side, just the odd numbers on the left side. Kind of neat. Now, of course, if you take five and you add it to three, you get eight. And lo and behold, that is exactly the number that is in between the two largest circles there. So it, in, in, and by the way, that is true of all of them. You take any two of the largest circles, you look at the next largest one in between them, it will add the number of antennae on those two. So, um, and it, that's true for every single one of them. Isn't that amazing? So it's as if the Mandelbrot set knows how to add. Kind of neat for a map, really, because we're just making a map of which numbers belong to that little formula. Who knew it would be, generate such an interesting shape? It's remarkable. So, let's zoom back out there. So keep in mind the overall shape of the Mandelbrot set. You got the big cardioid, then you got the main disc, that big circle, and other circles growing off of it, and you got that spike over there on the, uh, on the left. Now on that spike, there is a little black spot. I don't know if you can see it, but it's way over there. And we find if we zoom in on that, it's really, the results are really interesting. 
Yeah. It's a, it's a baby version of the entire Mandelbrot set, growing off the spike on the, on the parent. And uh, it's almost identical to the parent. The cardioid's the same, the circles are the same. It's got a spike of its own. The only thing that's different is the exterior. It's got extra spikes growing off of it. And it's interesting. We zoomed in on a spike, and the baby version had extra spikes. We'll find that's a common property of the Mandelbrot set. The baby version resembles the parent, but has extra stuff on the exterior resembling the part of the parent that it's growing off of. Now, if, we, if, we, if you notice that guy, he's got a spike, and he's got a little black thing on his spike as well. And if we zoom in on that, there's another one. Isn't that fascinating? Almost identical to its parent, except it's got even more spikes, and it's got spikes that branch off into spikes. And if you see, it's got a little baby version growing off of it as well. Isn't that wild? Now, you could do that forever. There's an infinite number, as far as we know, nobody's bothered to check, because we don't, we don't have an infinite amount of time. But as far as we've gone, it doesn't end. You can keep zooming in and get baby versions of the entire Mandelbrot set built in to the Mandelbrot set's tail. Isn't that wild? This type of property, this is called a fractal. A fractal is any shape that when you zoom in on it, you get smaller versions of the original shape, either exact versions or approximations. So this is a great example of a fractal. It's the first one I learned about, and it's really remarkable. And, and look how small that version is compared to the original when we zoom back out. Isn't that amazing? And in case you're wondering, that's the largest one. If you zoom out, there's nothing beyond it. That's kind of the, um, the atom version of it. So it's the first. But uh, pretty neat. And it has that, what we call scale invariance, that when you zoom in on it, it looks similar to the original. And you can zoom in on other portions of the Mandelbrot set as well. If you can zoom in on these, these uh, little dendrites type structures, they're quite beautiful. And the way they branch is beautiful. You might think, well, we'll get down and eventually it'll be smooth because it can't be infinitely wiggly, right? Well, it turns out it's infinitely wiggly. So no matter how much you zoom in on it, it continues to wiggle around and, and produce those shapes. Isn't that amazing? And so just, it gives you just a little window into the mind of God who is responsible for numbers and the relationships between them, what we would call laws of mathematics. Those stem from the mind of God. So you could do that for the rest of your life. There are, there are Google, uh, if, you, if you get on the internet, you can, you can Google Mandelbrot deep zooms, and there are zooms that will zoom in by a factor of a Google, a t you know, 10 to the power of 100. <laughs> so it's just amazing. It doesn't end. You don't get down to atoms, because math isn't made of atoms. It's made of what? It's made of math. It's, it, it, it's weird, right? So what I want to do is explore this shape and just kind of have fun with it, because it's amazing. And, but keep in mind what you're looking at. You're looking at a map of which points belong to the Mandelbrot set. That's it. So let's zoom in on this valley right here, which is called the Valley of the Seahorses. Mathematicians like to give nice, fun things to these, because if you look on the right, it looks like a bunch of upside-down seahorses. Pretty amazing. Now, the colors are arbitrary. I can change, and we'll change those every now and then just to keep things interesting. But by convention, the Mandelbrot points that do belong to the Mandelbrot set are black, and those points that do not are colored, and, the, and we tend to use brighter colors for points that are almost on the Mandelbrot set, but not quite, and darker colors for points that are far away. So let's take a look at one of these seahorses. Let's zoom in. Pretty amazing and, and quite beautiful, I think. And you might say, well, wait a minute, that, uh, that central hub over there, I mean, it, it's very bright. It's a bright blue, right? And yet, it, and yet, I said earlier, bright means it's very close to being on the Mandelbrot set. It doesn't look like it's on the Mandelbrot set because it looks like the next nearest black spot would be, well, maybe there. Well, it turns out uh, that's because there are some black threads that are smaller than a pixel. You can't see them. And so what's happening is there's a branch branching off from there that, that branches off and wiggles around and produces incredibly intricate shapes. It's just smaller than a pixel. You can't see it. And so no doubt there are black spots there. It's just they're smaller than the computer's ability to resolve. So that tells us that there's this incredibly complicated wiry structure that goes out and wiggles around. It's infinitely wiggly, whatever that means. It basically means no matter how much you zoom in, you still get wiggles. It, you will never get a section that's straight. And, uh, and it produces that very intricate and complex and beautiful structure. If we zoom in on the center of that seahorse, you get that kind of spiderweb-like looking structure. Isn't that amazing? 
again, you're just looking at a plot of which points belong to the Mandelbrot set. And in this case, you probably don't see hardly any black. It's there. It's just smaller than a pixel. Otherwise, you wouldn't have all those intricate structures. Now, I found from experience, if you zoom in on the center of that, you can zoom in to your heart's content, and it doesn't really look any different. That continues infinitely. It's an infinite spider web. It gets smaller and smaller, but if you, as you zoom in, you compensate for that. It just looks kind of the same. So I went off axis. Let's see what those strands are made of. What are the spider web strands made of? And we find that they're made of smaller spider web strands. That's kind of neat. Continue to zoom in there a little bit. And you can see there's two central hubs, one above and below. And then there's four in the middle, very small. And then it goes to eight, 16 as we zoom in. So two, four, eight, 16, 32, all the powers of two. That's interesting. So we zoom in on that central hub. You can see it goes from four to eight to 16. And look what's in the middle there. Isn't that interesting? So again, you get a itty bitty baby version of the entire Mandelbrot set. Fascinating, isn't it? Now, it's identical to the parent, except the exterior has extra stuff growing off of it. We zoomed in on a spider web, and you can see there's spider webs growing all over the exterior. So the baby version inherits the properties of the parent that it's growing off of. And by the way, that baby version, it's got a valley of seahorses as well, right? Which means you could zoom in on that, and you'd find other baby versions. So not only does the Mandelbrot set have an infinite number of babies, each of those babies has an infinite number of babies. So the Mandelbrot has not just infinite baby Mandelbrots, it's got an infinity of infinite baby Mandelbrots. So God's not just infinite, he's infinitely infinite. That's, that's mind-blowing. That'll keep you awake at night. Look how tiny this is compared to the original though, when we zoom all the way back out. Just a tiny little section. And there are many in there. I mean, there's an infinite number of them. So it just gives you a feel for... The, again, a little taste, a little window into the mind of God, what it must be like to be able to think infinitely. It blows our minds. Let's go back into the same valley, but this time we'll go to the left, and they call this the valley of the double spirals. The same valley, it's just whether you go right or left. Right is seat horses, left is double spirals. I really love these structures. They remind me of spiral galaxies. So as an astronomer, I really appreciate these. It's a double spiral because there are two independent strands that wrap around each other. If you follow one strand around, you'll find it misses. There's one in between. Okay, you might be able to do that with your eyes. I don't know. But uh, really beautiful. And again, this is just the Mandelbrot set wiggling around and making all those, that complex structure uh, because those are points. They're, if they're bright colored, they're very close to being on the Mandelbrot set and the darker blues are further away. We can zoom in on one of the strands. Now again, you zoom in on the center, it, it spirals forever, it's infinite. But if you zoom in on one of the side strands there, really beautiful structures. The little, I call them bow ties, because they look like, it's, it's two double spirals, like a little bow tie, right? And they intersect in the middle. And the, those are, each, each one of those two spirals that you see there at the bottom, in the top, each of those, they're double spirals, two independent strands wrapping around each other, and then they kind of they collide in the middle, and there's four in the middle, and then it goes to eight and, and 16 and 32 and so on, so it's all the powers of two. And again, you get a little baby version in the middle. And this time it's flipped around because we zoomed in on a spiral, and so he's, he's been rotated, not just 180 degrees, but probably like a million and 180, he's been rotated many times. So, isn't that amazing? And the, the stuff that he's growing along his exterior, well, we zoomed in on a double spiral, and the stuff that he's growing on his exterior is, are double spirals. Now, keep in mind, he's got a valley of double spirals as well. He's got a sp spike, and there's a little black spot on the tail. That's sure enough, that's a baby version. You could zoom in on that forever. And the more you zoom in, the prettier it gets. That's what's amazing to me. See, man-made structures don't do that. Man-made structures, you zoom in on them, and eventually they get they simpler and simpler. And then that's kind of the end of the, our ingenuity. We can't, we can't, well, we can't get down to atoms hardly anyway, but even if we could, that's it. Whereas these structures, the more you zoom on, in on them, the prettier they get. They get more complex. How can a small section of the Mandelbrot set be more complex than the Mandelbrot set? It's really strange. Another valley that's fun to zoom in, and I found that the interesting stuff really is in the valleys for whatever reason. Maybe there's a life lesson there, I don't know. But in any case, if you zoom in on this valley over here on the right, we call this the Valley of the Elephants. Again, mathematicians like to give fun names to these things. This is the only symmetric valley where the top and bottom look identical. 
And you can see, if we, especially if we look along the bottom, it looks like elephants marching one after the next, right? And each one of them is balancing on a circus ball, see? So pretty neat. Now keep that in mind. So there's, there are these circles, and they continue. They get smaller and smaller as you go in deeper into the valley. There's an infinite number of elephants there, an infinite number of circles, and one elephant on each circle. That'll be important later, one elephant per circle, okay? And the elephants, as you zoom in, they get smaller and their trunks get curlier. The, more you, the, more you, the deeper you go into that valley. So let's see what these elephants look like. And I thought, well, let's zoom in on their trunk because that looks interesting. This is a single spiral, not a double spiral. It's one strand that wraps around itself. So that's pretty neat. And if we go off axis, again, the center, you can zoom in forever. But if you go off axis, you find all kinds of intricate and beautiful structures. And we'll continue to zoom in there. You have the little bow tie structures, but this time they're made of single spirals instead of double spirals. So that, that, mathematical, can, that mathematical property continues. So now I think that's just amazing right there. I think that's just stunning. And if we continue to zoom in to the center, it goes from two to four to eight to 16 and so on. And sure enough, in the middle, there's a little baby mantle rut. We're not surprised this time, but isn't that phenomenal? Just amazing. And you could zoom in on that. That one's got a little baby on the tail. You could zoom in on that forever and so on. You could spend the rest of your life exploring this shape, and you would never get beyond the tip of the iceberg because it's infinite. It's infinitely complex. And the deeper you delve in, it takes the computer longer to work the problem. So after a while, you get impatient. You say, okay, I'm done. But um, you, you, could ex you could spend the rest of your life exploring its, the shape because it's infinite. There's an infinite number of babies in them. They're all slightly different from each other in terms of the, the stuff that's growing on their exterior. Pretty remarkable. And that's just one equation. That's z squared plus c. And then iterating it to see if this sequence of z stays small or gets big. One formula. It made me wonder what happens if you change the formula. You could spend the rest of your life studying just that formula. But there are other formulas out there. And I found that if you change C, if you make it like half C or two C, that just changes the size of the set. It's, it looks, it's the same shape. But if you change Z, you can get some interesting results. Instead of Z squared, what if we go with Z cubed and check all the points that when you run it under that formula, Z cubed, they remain small, you get a different shape. And it's also interesting and wonderful. And so we sometimes call this a multibrot because it's a multiple of the Mandelbrot set. So that's z cubed plus c. And you'll notice it's got some similar features to the Mandelbrot set. It's got, these, it's got a large feature in the middle, but instead of having one valley in it, it has two. That's called a nephroid. A nephroid is what happens when you take a circle half the size of the original and roll it around the original. See? So that's a nephroid. And it's exactly a nephroid for whatever reason. There it is. And then, remember, the Mandelbrot set had circles growing off of it. They have zero valleys. This has cardioids growing off of it. They have one valley. Everything's gone up by one. And I guess we'd expect that. We've gone from z squared to z cubed, so that's kind of wild. I also tried plotting intermediate powers. Like, instead of just going from z squared to z cubed, what happens if you go z to the power of 2.01 and 2.02 and so on and gradually change it from two to three, and then you can see how the one shape morphs into the other. So that's kind of fun to try that. So there's the nephroid, so that's the multibrot, and then we go back to the, the Mandelbrot. And you can see how most things get doubled. Some things get quadrupled. Like the, if you keep your eye on the baby uh, Mandelbrot that's on the end of the tail, it'll divide into two first, and then it'll be joined by a twin on the other side that, come, that pops in. So some things get quadrupled. Isn't that fun? Now, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, what is the least changed as, as you switch from one to the other? I'm thinking probably where the Valley of the Elephants was on the, on the right side there, that valley, seems to be the least changed. So that made me wonder, if we zoom in on what was Elephant Valley, do we still get elephants? So let's take a look. There are still elephants. Let's zoom in on a couple of them here. There you go, you get elephants. Now remember, previously we had a circle and one elephant on each circle. The circles have split into cardioids and there are now two elephants on each one, okay? 
So the number of elephants has doubled. And that's fascinating because previously we had an infinite number of elephants, and now we have twice that many. That'll keep you awake at night. If you zoom in on the trunks, what do you get? Do you, do you think we'll get those little bow tie structures again? Those were fun. Well, let's find out. We have a single spiral here. Zoom in on it. And instead of bow ties, you have tri ties. They look like those little fidget spinners, don't they? You got three of them. So it's interesting, it went from two to three. That makes sense. We've gone from z to the power of two to z to the power of three. That makes sense. And when you zoom in on the center, you find it's a baby version of the original shape. Remarkably similar. Here's the original shape, there's the baby version. Tilt it a little bit because we zoomed in on something that's spiraling, so. Isn't that interesting? And so you could spend the rest of your life exploring that shape. It too is infinite. It too contains an infinite number of baby versions of itself built into itself. Remarkable. But then it made me wonder, well, what if we go Z to the fourth? Well, then you get that. You get another shape. Also interesting, also infinite, also has infinite babies built into it. And by now I'm seeing a pattern. Z cubed has kind of a two-fold structure, right? It re it's like a reflection top and bottom. And Z to the fourth, it's got that three structure, doesn't it? So apparently it's the power minus one. So Z to the fourth gives you a three-fold structure. Z to the fifth gives you a four-fold structure, sure enough. Z to the sixth gives you a five-fold structure. And if you go Z to the seventh, you can get snowflakes. Isn't that neat? And if you zoom in on it, sure enough, you get baby snowflakes. No matter where you zoom in, eventually you land on baby versions. Pretty remarkable. And then, I try, then I thought, what about negative powers? Z to the negative two. Now a negative power is simply the reciprocal of the positive power, right? So Z to the negative two is one over Z squared. So it's a reciprocal. And Z to the negative two gets you that. Now this is interesting because uh, remember black means the points do belong to the set and colored means they don't. So the points that are black are now on the outside. Taking it to a negative power has flipped the thing inside out. And so now most of the universe belongs to that set. All of the universe except that little section in the middle, which is the interesting part. And so if you zoom in on the middle, the, part, the portions that are not part of that set, um, you find that it has a fractal pattern to it. It, looks, it, it gives it kind of a three-dimensional look. It's not really three-dimensional, it's two-dimensional. It's just because it looks like these pebbles are overlapping, it kind of messes with your brain a little bit because uh, we, we, we understand that when one object's in front of another, it blocks it and so on. And so if you zoom in on any section of that, it's, first of all, it's beautiful. And then if you zoom in on any section, you'll find that the overall pattern repeats infinitely. So again, you could zoom in on that for the rest of your life and it goes forever and ever and ever and ever. And that's what I would expect as a Christian because mathematics reflects the thinking of God. And so of course it's gonna continue. And it's beautiful and that reflects the thinking of God too. God has a sense of beauty and he's built that not only into his physical universe but into the abstract world of mathematics as well. So there's Z to the negative two. What if we go Z to the negative three? Well, then you get that. Oh, so now it's apparently the power the absolute magnitude of the power plus one. So negative three gives you a fourfold shape. Negative four gives you a fivefold shape. Negative five is another way to make snowflakes, inside out snowflakes. So that's pretty neat. And it's just amazing what you can do when you explore these shapes. The beauty that's built into them is just remarkable. These amazing shapes that are, there's something about them that's just objectively pretty. It's just wonderful. And no matter where you look, you know, you zoom in on any portion of that, it's just interesting and beautiful and wonderful, and there's different formula you can try. And now not all formulae give fractals, but a lot of them do. And uh, that's a section of the, if you take the trigonometric sine function, for example, you get that. It's stunningly beautiful. So my question then is, what does all this mean? I mean, we're looking at these pretty shapes, that's, that's fine, but what does it mean? In particular, what causes the beauty in fractals? How can we make sense of the fact that they're astonishingly beautiful? What causes the complexity in fractals? The fact that they repeat infinitely and have all these intricate properties. So let's take the first one first. What causes the beauty in fractals? What are the possibilities? Some, some would say, well, it's the man-made color scheme, right? Now, I chose the colors. I think, I think that's a nice color scheme. Some, some programs that plot fractals, they pick really terrible colors, and shame on them, because these things are pretty, and we wanna, we wanna bring out the beauty in them. But you know what? The, the color may enhance the beauty, but it doesn't create it. It doesn't create it, because frankly, if we took away the color, it's, it's still beautiful. That shape is objectively beautiful, isn't it? 
I, don't, I didn't have to come and convince you and plead with you to find that attractive. It's, there's something about it that's just beautiful. It's something about the shape, and the shape is determined by the laws of mathematics. So it's not the color scheme. I do think the colors enhance it a bit, um, the way perhaps salt brings out the flavor of a, of a good meal, but it doesn't create the flavor. It just brings it out a bit. So it's not the man-made color scheme. And by the way, God made colors anyway, so I can't really take credit for the color either. They're his colors. I just chose which ones were assigned to a given value, and that's the result, and it's stunning. It's beautiful. Did the computer create the beauty? Well, I used a computer program to plot those shapes, but the computer's not determining what the shape is. The laws of mathematics are. Remember, we checked the first two points manually. We ran through that little formula. Theoretically, you could plot that whole thing by hand. It would just take forever. The computer does it quickly. It's not creating the beauty at all. It's just letting you see it quickly so that you don't have to hand, hand draw these things. Did people make this? Well, people can't, it's, it's infinite. People can't create infinite things. Now, we did select the formula, that's true, but we found that changing the formula doesn't make, you, st you still get beauty. There's still somehow inherent beauty built into math. It's not something that people created. It's there. It's been there since creation. It's just we didn't have the technology until the 1980s to be able to graph these things. So this is a recent discovery. What causes the complexity in fractals, the fact that they're infinite and that the, you know, they branch and they branch into branches and so on, this incredible complexity. Did the computer create it? Again, no. The computer's just plotting it. The computer's allowing us to see it quickly and to explore the shape and to zoom in. But it's the laws of mathematics that determine what the shape is. Numbers and the laws of mathematics that govern the relationship between those numbers. The computer didn't create it any more than microscopes create bacteria. Microscopes just allow us to see bacteria. They're, they're all, they've always been there. In the same way, this shape has always existed in the abstract world of mathematics. It's just we didn't, until we had computers, we had no way of graphing it quickly. Did human beings create it? Again, no, we can't create infinite things. Nobody sat down and said, you know, I think I'm gonna draw a, a, you know, a cardioid and then I'm gonna draw an infinite number of circles. Well, you'd never get done, right? Because we can't, it takes a, you know, we're finite beings. We can't create infinite things. And it's not just, and again, the Mandelbrot set's not just an infinite, it's infinitely infinite, because each of the babies has an infinite number of babies. So we can't do things like that. We didn't create it. In fact, human beings were astonished when this shape emerged. You wouldn't be astonished by something you yourself made. You make something and, well, how about that? I had no idea it would turn out that way. That's not gonna work. Did the formula create it? Well, in a sense, the formula determines what the set is, but it's not the formula that determined that it would have that shape. It's the laws of mathematics that determined that it would have that shape. And we found when we changed the formula, you still get beauty and you get these amazing shapes. So the complexity and the beauty of fractals is somehow built into math itself. And that's wild because we think about, well, what is, what is math? I mean, it's not like other things that we study. It's not like rocks and, and fossils and living organisms and stars and galaxies, all of which are made of atoms. A math isn't made of atoms. It's made of ideas. And that's kind of wild. The, the definition, the dictionary definition of math is mathematics is the study of the relationship between numbers. The relationship between numbers. Well, that makes sense. When you do math, you're dealing with numbers. If you're, if you're in algebra, you may not know what the number is, and then you, you're solving for it and stuff like that. But that's what it's all about. But what are numbers? And that seems like a silly question. Well, we know what numbers are. I mean, I can count. But have you ever thought about how you would define what a number is? Sometimes those things that are very basic to us, they're hard to define. The best I could find, the best dictionary definition I could find of what are numbers, are numbers are a concept of quantity. I think that's a pretty good definition. This may not be complete, but it's sufficient, right? Uh, numbers are a concept of quantity. So when you think about the amount of something, you think you're, that, that thought is a number, okay? So a concept of quantity. Now concepts, are, they're abstract in nature. Concepts are not made up of atoms, they're made up of thoughts. They're not physical, rather they exist in the mind. Concepts require a mind. That's important. Numbers are concepts and therefore they require a mind. They don't exist physically. You can't actually see a number. And you might say, well, no, I see the number three there. But you're not actually seeing the number three, you're seeing a written representation of the number three. Because if that is the number three, then I just destroyed the number three and children will not have to count one, two, four, and so on, right? Yeah, so that's not, that's not the number three, that's a numeral. 
Uh, numerals are not numbers, they're representations of numbers. And of course, if you're Roman, you, could, you can represent the number three with three vertical lines, right? And that'll work too. So now human beings created numerals. We're the ones that decided that a three should look like that and so on, right? But we didn't invent three. We just invented the representation for it. So numbers have existed before people, and that's, that's important because laws of math are conceptual. They exist in a mind. Now, where do these laws come from? Where do these laws of math, the fact, you know, the Pythagorean theorem, or just the fact that two plus two equals four, where does that idea come from? Well, in the, in the biological world, there's all kinds of wonderful things in the world of biology, and some of them are very complex. And how do secularists try to explain the complexity in biology? Evolution. That's why it didn't start complex. It started very simple, but then over time it became more complex. Is that going to work with numbers? Did laws of math evolve? It, was it like, well, two plus two used to equal three, and then over millions of years it became four? <laughs> That's absurd on the face of it, isn't it? Laws of math do not evolve. They have an eternal quality to them, and that should, you know, something that, uh, that, that Christians would expect, I would think. In the Christian worldview, we can make sense of that. They didn't evolve, though. You realize that in, in biology, there are creation biologists and evolution biologists. In geology, there are creation geologists and evolution geologists. There are no evolutionary mathematicians. There are, there are mathematicians that believe in biological evolution, but nobody does math as if it evolved. When it comes to math, really, we're all creationists. And I think that's interesting. Were laws of math created by people, though? Because some people will claim that. They'll say human beings made laws of math. And a moment's reflection reveals that's absurd. No human being decided that 2 plus 2 should equal 4. We discovered that 2 plus 2 should equal 4. If we created laws of mathematics, we could have made them a lot simpler, right? Let's just make everything, no matter what you add it, equal to 1. 3 plus 3 equals 1. 7 plus 2 equals 1. That would be a lot easier. It wouldn't work though. You'd find, you know, if, if, you have, if you hire an architect who believes that, you better fire him immediately, right? That's not gonna have application in the real world. They were not created by people. They were discovered by people, to be sure. And we haven't discovered all of them. We don't know what all the laws of math are, but we've discovered rules of addition and we've discovered things like the Pythagorean theorem and so on. Some people say, well, they come from the universe. Laws of mathematics are a reflection of the universe. I think that's hard to, I think that's hard to defend. Because laws of mathematics deal with things, I mean, it, it, they're very applicable in the universe, that's true, and that's a separate issue that we're going to have to deal with. But mathematics goes beyond the physical universe. I remember in one of my calculus classes, we learned how to compute hypervolumes, volumes in higher dimensions than three. Like there's, there's, the, there's a four-dimensional equivalent of a sphere. A sphere is three-dimensional, right? Height, width, depth. There's a four-dimensional equivalent, and we can calculate what its hypervolume would be, despite the fact that that cannot exist in the physical universe. That would not make sense if laws of math were merely reflections of the physical universe. How could they go beyond the physical universe? There's something transcendent about the laws of mathematics. They go beyond human experience. They go beyond physical nature. Well, I would argue that laws of math stem from the mind of God. They are reflections of the way God thinks when he's thinking about numbers, that's, that's what the laws of math are. God's mind determines those laws, and our minds discover those laws, you see. And if you think about what laws of mathematics are, they're not physical. You can't stub your toe on a law of mathematics, or swallow one, or trip over one, or get indigestion from one, they, because they're conceptual. They exist in the mind. They're conceptual, universal, invariant, exceptionless entities, and that makes perfect sense if they're reflections of the way God thinks because God's thoughts are conceptual, all thoughts are. Uh, God is omnipresent, so of course laws of mathematics will work everywhere in the universe. They work just as well in Andromeda as they do here, and all astronomers assume that, despite the fact that no secular astronomer has ever been to Andromeda. How do you know they work there? He can't give an answer to that. I can. I can say, well, because they reflect God's thinking. God upholds the Andromeda galaxy by the word of his power. It's his mind that controls that, and God's omnipresent. So, of course, they're going to work there. Uh, they're invariant, meaning they don't change with time. Why? Because God doesn't change with time. He's beyond time. He says, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. God doesn't change because he, he created time. Of course, he's beyond it. He can step into time and do things, but he's not bound by it as we are. And therefore, laws of mathematics, which reflect his thinking, will have a timeless quality to them. 
And they're exceptionalist because God's sovereign. There is no truth outside the mind of God. Everything that is true is something that God thinks. And that includes all mathematical truths. And there are an infinite number of mathematical truths. See, I can make sense of that, though, as a Christian, because my God is infinite. And so it's not a problem for him to think of an infinite number of things. We can't do that. We're finite. But God can. He's infinite. And I can explain our ability to discover some of the laws of mathematics because we're made in God's image. And God has revealed himself to us. See, I can make sense of math and the, and the fact that fractals are beautiful. I would expect that. Math, of course math's going to be beautiful. It comes from God. Of course it's going to have beauty in it. Of course it's going to be organized and logical because God is. It makes sense. Now, the naturalist has a dilemma. The naturalist is someone who believes that everything that exists is within nature. Now, he's got to acknowledge that laws of mathematics are conceptual. They exist in the mind because that's what they are. You think math, you don't stub your toe on it. Math is conceptual. It requires a mind in order to exist. Yet, laws of mathematics existed before people. So they're not the product of a human mind. That's a big problem for naturalists who believe that at some point this universe had no minds in it because it allegedly started in a big bang billions of years ago and the first life evolved, but the first life was non-thinking anyway. It wasn't until brains developed that math developed. But wait a minute, the universe obeys math. The planets, the way the planets orbit is determined by uh, Kepler's third law, P squared equals A cubed. They're, they're obeying a mathematical formula. But they did that before people for two days. Now, in the secular view, for billions of years, they did that before human beings came around. So you see the problem? The naturalist understands that math requires a mind, and yet he's got, he, he believes in that mathematics worked before there were any minds. That's a problem. So it's not a problem in my worldview, because in my worldview, there's always been a mind, the mind of God. And that is the mind that determines the laws of mathematics and their properties. So it's not a problem for me. I can make sense of that. But it's a problem for the naturalist, a huge one. We also have what we might call physical fractals. So the, the fractals we've looked at, the Mandelbrot set and the Multibrots, they are mathematical plots. They don't exist anywhere in the physical universe. They exist in the mind. We can plot them using a computer, but their existence is, is abstract. But there are things that are made of atoms that have a fractal quality to them. Now, they don't repeat forever. Physical fractals don't go, in, go on forever because eventually you get down to atoms and atoms are not fractal anymore. So physical fractals don't repeat infinitely, but they do repeat many times. And so I want to show you some of these, these physical fractals that are approximate fractals. For example, uh, snowflakes. Snowflakes have a fractal quality to them. They, they have that six-sided nature because of the shape of the water molecule. And when you zoom in on a snowflake, you still get that six-sided symmetry. It looks smaller sections of a snowflake kind of resemble the whole snowflake. Maybe not exactly, but they are fractal in nature. And that's one of the reasons they're so beautiful. And they are beautiful. It's just amazing. These little gems from heaven that the Lord sends us every year. And we scrape them off our car. Uh, you know, They're beautiful. They're beautiful. And no two exactly alike, as far as anyone's checked anyway. That's stuff that grows on your windows sometimes. I also thought that was fascinating when I was a kid looking at that. I still think it's fascinating that you get these fractal shapes in, in terms of the way ice freezes. That is wonderful and beautiful. Ferns, the way ferns branch, is fractal because they have a central stem and that branches into smaller stems, which branch into smaller stems and smaller ones till you get down to the little leaflets. It's fractal. It doesn't go forever, but it goes several steps. I even found fractal broccoli. So I guess broccoli is good for something after all. There you go. It's called Rom Romanesco broccoli. It's more similar to cauliflower, actually. But you can see the overall shape is a cone. And what's that cone made of? Smaller cones, which are made of smaller cones, which are made of smaller cones. Isn't that wild? The way coastlines branch is fractal. Because they branch and they branch into smaller branches, which branch into smaller branches. The smaller ones resemble an overall flavor the entire shape, maybe not exactly, but similar. The way mountaintops branch, when you look at mountains from above, the, uh, the valleys and the way they branch and so on, it's fractal in nature. Clouds are fractal in nature. Am I looking at the entire sky there? Or am I zoomed in on one very small section of a cloud? You can't tell because the smaller clouds resemble the entire cloud. 
That's the nature, that's scale invariance, that's what a fractal is. Lightning, the way lightning branches is fractal because you have the main branch and then it branches into smaller branches which branch into smaller branches, branch into smaller branches. If I took a picture of a spark, it would look very similar to a bolt of lightning because there's scale invariance there, you see. And so it's, pretty, it's really pretty wonderful. And, and you can even see the lightning branching if you take um, very rapid animation exposures and slow them down. You can see how the lightning branches until the leader connects and then most of the current goes down the leader. Uh, but really pretty remarkable. So Now here's my question then. Why is it that we have these fractals that occur in math and also in the physical world? That's interesting. I mean, this shape right here, that's a mathematical graph. That's a multibrot. That's z to the seventh power plus c. That's what you get. That does not exist in the physical universe, but this does. You can see that every winter. This shape, it's part of the Mandelbrot set. It's one of those little antennae that branches out. It does not exist physically, but that does. Uh, this shape, it might look like a plant. It's actually a mathematical graph. It's called a Barnsley fern. A Barnsley fern is where each leaf of the fern is the entire fern. Let me show you. If you take the entire fern, it becomes one of its own leaves. You see that? And you could do that an infinite number of times. You see? So each leaflet is the entire fern. They're flipped on the other side, but it's still the entire fern. So that does not exist physically, but that one does. Hmm. How is that happening? This is a mathematical graph. It doesn't exist in the physical universe, but that stuff grows on your windows. It does exist in the physical universe. This shape is a mathematical plot. This shape does not exist in reality. This unfortunately does. <laughs> this shape, you can't see that anywhere in a telescope. It's part of the Mandelbrot set in the Valley of the Double Spirals. But that you can see in a telescope. It's the Whirlpool Galaxy. I've seen it. Hmm. So why do fractals occur both in math and the physical world? Now, in one sense, many, and many people would answer this way, they would say, well, the physical universe obeys mathematical laws. And that's true as far as it goes. The universe obeys math, right? You have like F equals MA or E equals MC squared. The universe obeys math. And so it stands to reason if fractals can occur in math, they can occur in the physical universe, which obeys math. Fair enough. But then I'm, that just pushes the question back. Now I'm going to ask, why does the physical universe obey math? Because math is something you do in your mind. It's abstract. The universe is not something you do in your mind. It's not abstract. It's physical. Huh. How do we make sense of the fact that the universe obeys math? Now, as a Christian, I can answer that. Mathematics is a reflection of the way God thinks. And whose mind upholds the universe? God's mind, right? The Bible's clear about that. God upholds all things. Christ, in particular, upholds all things by the word of his power. In him, all things consist or hold together. God thinks mathematically. God's mind controls the physical universe. Therefore, the physical universe will obey math. That has to be the case in the Christian worldview. But in a secular worldview, how do you answer that? In a secular worldview, there's not supposed to be a mind that's over the physical universe. It's just chance. So how do you make sense of why the, the physical universe is compelled to obey mathematics, laws of mathematics? The, the secular worldview can't account for the properties of laws of mathematics, the fact that they're universal, exceptionless, they don't change with time, and so on. They're, and, and it can't make sense of those things. And it cannot make sense of why the physical universe feels compelled to obey laws of mathematics without exception. There are no exceptions, right? The universe always obeys math. And if you don't think this is a perplexing dilemma, I have to tell you that there are seculars who have tried to deal with this problem without much success. There was a uh, physicist, Dr. Eugene Wigner. He was a brilliant physicist. He won the Nobel Prize in physics. The guy's brilliant. And he wrote a wonderful article called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. I love this article because he's approaching this from a non-Christian perspective. That's the, and, and because of that, He's perplexed. He, he, in the article, he says, it is difficult to avoid the impression that a miracle confronts us here. Now, he's being tongue-in-cheek. He's not talking about a literal miracle. It's difficult to avoid the impression that a miracle confronts us here, or the two miracles of the existence of laws of nature and of the human mind's capacity to define them. He says, it's amazing enough that in this chance universe, it obeys laws. What's even more amazing, we can discover what they are, and they happen to obey math. That's awfully convenient. 
It's like two different miracles. What is his conclusion? And I'm not making fun of him. He's, a, he's more intelligent than I am, to be sure. It's just God has opened my eyes, and he hasn't. I don't know if he ended up converting or not. I don't know. But what is his conclusion? The miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. That's the best that the secular world can do. The smartest, one of the smartest human beings who has lived but apparently did not approach it from a Christian perspective, cannot answer a very simple question that all of you can answer. If you're a believer, you can say, I know why the universe obeys math. The same God whose mind is responsible for math is responsible for upholding creation. Of course the physical universe will obey math. It has to. Secular world, they can't answer it. And even, again, very brilliant man, but he couldn't answer that simple question because he's approaching it from a non-Christian worldview. That's the problem. So we've seen that there is beauty of infinite complexity built into numbers. That's amazing. And nobody knew about it until really 1980. That's when Benoit Mandelbrot, the, the set's named after him, he was, a, uh, he was a scientist at IBM, and he started exploring these things about the time computers were fast enough to plot these shapes. And who knew that there was all this beauty built into numbers? But numbers are abstract. They're conceptions of quantity, which means they require a mind. Concepts require a mind. Now, in my worldview, I can make sense of that because there's a mind that is sovereign over all of nature, and that's the mind of God. Numbers reflect the way God thinks about quantities. That's why they are logical. That's why they have these self-consistent properties because God, God is logical and self-consistent. He doesn't deny himself. He is internally consistent and faithful. And so mathematics has a type of faithfulness to it. It has beauty to it because God has a sense of beauty. The secular worldview cannot account for the existence and properties of numbers or mathematical truths. They can't. They can't make sense of it. And we've seen the results of them trying to do that. They can't do it. Numbers existed before people because the way planets orbit the sun is determined by math. Yep. And yet human beings, you know, we did, we, if we invented math, then planets would not have been able to orbit before us. And that's, that doesn't make any sense. So, but I can make sense of that. I can make sense of the fact that laws of mathematics are universal, they apply everywhere, invariant, they don't change with time, abstract, they're not physical, they exist in a mind, because they reflect the way God thinks about quantities. I can make sense of that. I can make sense of why the physical world contains fractals, because the physical world obeys math, and I can make sense of why the physical world obeys math, because it's obeying God, God's decree. The secular worldview cannot account for why the physical universe obeys math. Can't do it. It doesn't work. But I can because the universe is controlled by the mind of God. So of course it's going to have these things in it. So I hope that's encouraging to you that when we look at when we look at something like math, that for many students, you know, they're a little math phobic. That's just that subject they study in in school and it, it's just hard and when are we going to use this anyway? And well, you, you're learning to think like God. That ought to encourage you. When you do math, you're learning to think in a way that's consistent with God's thoughts, at least about numbers. And there's beauty in it, the beauty that we can make sense of and that has no secular explanation. I have never heard a good secular explanation for fractals. It's just not there. They, they have to accept that they exist because they do. But there's no secular explanation for them. Uh, well, we have this presentation, by the way, on, on DVD and also on Blu-ray because it really is very pretty. And I want you to enjoy those shapes, we have that as well. And then I, I wrote a book on this topic too, a few years ago called Fractals, The Secret Code of Creation. And it's gonna go, it's gonna cover what I covered today, but it's gonna go into a little more depth too. And it'll, it'll show you some other equations you can try and it'll show you the beautiful shapes that result. Uh, I really intended for this to be a coffee table type book. And uh, I think it'll be a great witnessing, witnessing tool because you just put this on your coffee table and it's beautiful and people will pick it up and look at it because it's stunning. And then they'll, and as they read through it, it gives a presentation for why only the biblical God can make sense of this, and it presents the gospel. I'm hoping people will be saved as a result of that. And uh, as I hope that the Holy Spirit will use that, let's put it that way, as one of the vessels by which he reaches people. So, And it, the book also comes with a CD with computer software on it, and so you can explore these shapes for yourselves. And it's got multiple programs on there, including the program that I use. I wrote uh, the program that, that um, plots the shapes that you saw today. And that program is included in that book, along with all the pictures that are in the book. One of the neat things about the program I wrote is it stores in the picture the location of the fractal that it's on. 
So after you generate your picture, you say, I want to continue to zoom in on that. You can take the picture, drop it back in the program, and continue to zoom in. And so that's kind of fun. So it's, it's just fun to explore these things and, and see, explore a universe that even, you know, 50 years ago, nobody knew about it. That's cool. And you can do it right on your home computer. Pretty neat. Uh, ultimate proof of creation that goes through some of the issues I talked about today in terms of uh, the Christian worldview being the only worldview that can account for things like mathematics and science and laws of logic and morality and so on. We have that on DVD as well. Understanding Genesis, uh, refuting the idea that, uh, that Genesis is just a myth or it shouldn't be taken literally. No, it's, it's real history. And we can demonstrate that logically from the scriptures. We have that on DVD as well. Uh, I won't go through all these, but uh, Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, How to Better Enjoy the Night Sky from a Christian Perspective. That's a fun, fun resource. And Taking Back Astronomy, How to Refute the Big Bang in the Billions of Years. And we have a DVD that goes along with that, Astronomy Reveals Creation. Uh, Physics of Einstein, if you want to get a little, a little more in depth into some of the really cool science that Einstein discovered, it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And I wrote this at a, it's at a layman level, but I put in-depth boxes. If you want to go into a little more depth, you can do that, or you can skip those, and I won't tell anybody, that's fine. Uh, dinosaurs in the Bible, that's a great one for the kids. I'm going to present that to the younger kids uh, tomorrow, actually, at the school here. So, and then remember, you can get the, the uh, packs, the book pack for 20% discount, the uh, DVD pack for 20% discount, or the library pack for 30% discount. We only do this at conferences. We already had an email come in just today. Where can I get the book pack on the website? You can't. It's, it's only at conferences. So that's just a great way to get these things very quickly and um, at a reduced cost. That'll probably put me out of business, but that's okay. We want to bless you. And so please get those in our children's resources as well. I didn't write these, but I highly endorse them. The Answers Book for Kids, they're just wonderful, wonderful resources that give concise answers to the questions that kids tend to ask about creation. And then we have our uh, free monthly newsletter. Make sure you signed up for that. Make sure you put your email or you'll get nothing. This is an electronic newsletter. And then check us out on the web as well at biblicalscienceinstitute.com. So I want to thank you very much. Really appreciate it. God bless.